In our next case of 2023-0472, Disciplinary Council versus Tracy Hunter. For those who are here, there's a change on the bench. I would like to thank Judge Ronald Lewis from the Second District Court of Appeals for sitting in place of Justice Dieters today. And I would like to thank Judge Sean Gallagher of the Eighth District Court of Appeals, who's sitting in for Justice DeWine. Thank you, judges, for being here today. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Good morning. On behalf of the respondent, Tracy Hunter. Chief Justice, may it please the court, and please forgive me for being late. The uh, ladies' room had a line. <laughs> <laughs> That'll happen. Okay. There are three constitutional issues that I would like the court to consider that are constitutional uh, in nature um, that I believe warrant rejecting the recommendation of the Board of Conduct to um, permanently or indefinitely suspend me. And forgive me, my name is Tracy Hunter and I'm representing myself pro se. The first point I'd like to bring before this honorable court is that the relator violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, the right of the petitioner, who is African American, when the relator charged the respondent with violation of 292142, despite failing to identify any documents that they alleged that she provided her family member. But they did not charge or suspend Supreme Court Justices Pat DeWine, former prosecutor Dieters, now Justice DeWine, who are white, when Justice DeWine secured a public contract for his son in the Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office. But unlike this case, their prescribed conduct fits squarely within the four corners of the statute. Secondly, when a felony conviction was the sole underlying basis for relator's finding, it violated petitioner's right to due process when relators failed to stay dis disciplinary proceedings until after the resolution of a pending post-conviction motion to dismiss based on the state's failure to charge Justices Dieter and DeWine for violating 29-21-42 and newly discovered evidence that Special Prosecutor Scott Croswell engaged in prosecutorial misconduct and malicious prosecution when he failed to disclose the relationship between him and his wife, former juvenile court judge Stephanie Croswell, and jury forewoman Sandra Kirkham, Sandra Kirkham in petitioner's case. The third point, it was also a violation of respondents' due process rights when the board rejected all of her exhibits refused to allow her to present a closing argument and refused to give her time to retain a new lawyer after her lawyer quit when she confronted him about failing to provide a legal brief to review on the day that it was due. Petitioner then explained to the board that she could not possibly find a new lawyer on a case so high profile in 14 days and requested additional time to seek an attorney, but he denied that request. Petitioner then filed a, a respondent then filed a motion for reconsideration based on the fact that, again, 14 days was simply not enough time for me to find a case or find an attorney in a case that has been going on for almost 14 years in the state of Ohio. And finally, last point, I mean, no disrespect uh, to the bench here today, but it is a violation of law and ethics for Justice Patrick Fisher to preside over the objection today before this court when his daughter, Assistant Prosecutor Kathleen Caroline Fisher, was a prosecuting attorney in my courtroom and filed affidavits that led to me being falsely charged with two felony counts of tampering with evidence and forgery on my judicial entries. Furthermore, Justice Fisher presided over a second case from my courtroom 
in which prosecutors falsified court records, then charged me, Judge Hunter, with two counts of forgery and tampering with evidence, and the state's computer expert testified that the state withheld Brady evidence during my trial that the prosecutors knew before they charged me with crime that I had not altered my judicial entries, but that in fact, personnel working at the direction of the other judge had altered and amended some of my judicial entries after I signed them. The metadata analysis on the computer showed that I had not done it. Prosecutor Scott Croswell knew that, yet still charged me with four felony counts of tampering with evidence and forgery. Those four counts formed the basis of the ultimate 10 counts of which I was charged as the first African-American juvenile court judge in Hamilton County. Five additional counts were charged against me by Scott Croswell after then Prosecutor Joe Dieters failed to answer 12 lawsuits that were filed against me in my official capacity as judge. He insisted on representing me as the statutory attorney for Hamilton County. I requested independent legal representation due to the fact that he had just opposed me in an election lawsuit that was still pending at the time he insisted on representing me as judge. He allowed 12 writs of certiorari or 12 writs of prosendendo to lapse against me and when I filed a complaint with this court, the Ohio Supreme Court, with a disciplinary board, they dismissed my complaint and several weeks later I was charged with felony crimes in office at the accusation of Joseph T. Dieters, a violation of the separation of powers. I was charged under section 292142 having an unlawful interest in a public contract. Now basic criminal law 101 is that in order to be found guilty of a statute, you must prove each and every single element of the statute. In order for me to have been convicted under section 292142, I, a public official, would have had to knowingly authorize or authorize or employ the authority or influence of the public official's office, my office, to secure authorization of any public contract in which the public official, myself, or my family had an interest. The reason I suggest before this honorable court today that my constitutional rights of equal protection have been violated is that I was accused of allegedly providing confidential or what is now deemed non-public records to my brother, which is not identified in this statute. But what is identified in the four corners of the statute is that a justice shall not call or email the prosecutor of Hamilton County and ask him to hire his, his son in the prosecutor's office and he respond with another email that says hire him. Yet I just listened to Justice Kennedy say, without the confidence in the legal system, we don't function. How do we function when I am forced to present my case before a judge who violated canon two of the judicial code of conduct, which cl clearly states that if you are aware of the underlying facts of a matter, then you must recuse yourself. I filed over a 127 page recusal several weeks ago within 15 days as the law requires and asked Justice Fisher to recuse himself. Nine days later, he issued a three sentence respond, response and stated, due to the unusual request of respondent, having taken it under consideration, I deny her request. He didn't deny the information that was in the sworn affidavit that I provided. So again, how can I stand before you as the first African American judge in Hamilton County Juvenile Court now suspended without my license for the past almost 10 years come January while justices who actually violated that statute are ruling in my case, presiding over my law license and determining whether or not I will be indefinitely suspended which could amount to a permanent disbarment.
Again, no respect, no disrespect to the court. One of the arguments that I made before the Board of Conduct, as I suggested, was I was denied the right to submit a closing argument. Yes, I, I, I showed up for a hearing. My attorney, Lou, was uh, uh, um, representing me at the time. I had a the honorable judge, um, Jennifer Branch, came from Cincinnati. She was subpoenaed. And she, in fact, testified that the 12 cases that were filed against me they in fact went unanswered and resulted in default judgments, and she took up those cases. The problem is I was charged with five felony counts of theft in <coughs> office and misuse of a credit card for filing answers in the writs that the prosecutor failed to answer. I was charged for doing the job that the prosecutor failed to do. The general public doesn't understand when they see media accounts and newspaper and TV accounts uh, that say that a judge committed theft in office, um, that it was related to her job as a judge and she was doing the job that the prosecutors failed to do. And after I made my complaint to this court and they dismissed my complaint, he recused himself immediately, but then he assigned new counsel to my case. Um, Nami Farouz, Farouz Nami, and James Bogan. They were paid $80,000 by taxpayer dollars in Hamilton County, and they too failed to answer those complaints, but they received $80,000. That sounds like securing a public contract. During my trial, which started September 8th of 2014, a week into my trial, Prosecutor Dieters hired Scott Croswell's son in the prosecutor's office. Scott Croswell received a million dollars to represent or to take over the case from Dieter. So he received a million dollars, which also sounded like securing a public contract. Because the statute 2921-42, it doesn't just refer to um, family members, it refers to business associates. And at the time that that million dollars was provided to Scott Croswell as a special prosecutor, he was the divorce lawyer for Joe Dieters. That sounds like a business association to me. That sounds like a conflict of interest to me. And so today, and forgive me, I failed to ask for um, rebuttal time, and so I'm going to ask at this time if this honorable court will allow me at two minutes to take my seat uh, so that I can uh, listen to relator. But the bottom line is, I provided a case, Schmidt, to this court for consideration. Schmidt was the only case that the prosecutors did not use, which was actually a violation of 2921-42. Every case, McAuliffe, um, um, Terry, um, Gallagher, that the, that the relator put before you were cases where judges had sold cocaine, burned down their houses, for insurance fraud, uh, worked, had employees uh, working for them for uh, 20 years, tax fraud. They compared me to all of those individuals, all those federal cases, yet did not cite Schmidt, the only case that cites Ohio Revised Code 29-21-42. And it was a, a gentleman in Green Township for 20 years had been abusing his position as the treasurer of Green Township. He received a misdemeanor after 20 years of receiving enormment from his position, his public official position. He received a 12-month suspended sentence, entire sentence stay, 12 months after 20 years of abusing this system in his public office. I have been suspended without my livelihood, without my law license, without my ability to provide for myself for almost 10 years when justices on this honorable court have abused and violated the exact same statute that they accused me of, yet no evidence was submitted in my case. No evidence was submitted to show that I had violated 
that statute. Counsel, I apologize. Isn't, isn't Smith distinguishable because he was not a judge and he also was not convicted of a felony? Isn't that correct? He was not um, convicted of a felony because he was not charged with a felony. Correct. And so I've been trying to wrap my brain around why this white county public official, he was still an elected official, that's why I used the case. Right. Notwithstanding, it was the only case. But it is distinguishable, though, because it wasn't, it is distinguishable. A, it wasn't a felony, correct? Indeed, it's distinguishable. And he was not a judge, correct? But it also bears to question, that why am I the only judge in the state of Ohio that has been charged with that particular offense, yet I did not provide a public contract? That's the problem. It's like the movie, Show Me the Money. I've been saying for the last 10 years, show me the contract. I didn't secure a contract. There's no evidence of a contract. And quite honestly, in response to the, the, the question or, uh, regarding the documents of the juvenile court, I know that most courts in the state of Ohio are very different than the juvenile court, so most people probably don't even understand the laws of the court, which is perhaps why a federal judge and a magistrate white might look at the fact and decide that I somehow violated the statute. But the truth of the matter is that in the juvenile court, section 149.435, records of confidentiality, says this section does not prohibit the disclosure of information described in Division B of this section to any of the following. Two, an employee of the Department of Youth Services, a probation officer, a juvenile court judge, or an employee of a public children's services agency or a county department of job and family services who is supervising the alleged delinquent child or arrestee who is also an abused child and who is under 18 years of age. Three, and this is what's most important because I was accused of providing confidential records and first of all, did not happen. But notwithstanding, section three says that that section does not apply to an employee of a law enforcement agency for use in the employee's defense of a civil or administrative action arising out of the employee's involvement in the case that gave rise to the civil or administrative action. It was impossible for me to have violated 2921.42 because the law itself says that even had the facts as they allege, which did not happen, had happened, a employee of a law enforcement agency, which includes the juvenile court, is entitled absolutely to have every record that is available to uh, defend the charges against them. Still didn't happen, but that law, had it happened, would have precluded me being charged as a judge in that particular, um, in that particular instance. And finally, I do want to say this. The juvenile court personnel manual Section 6.1 of the Hamilton County Juvenile Court Personnel Manual entitled Fair Employment Rights and Responsibilities of the Standard Operating Procedure, uh, Section G says, once a complaint has been made under this policy, there's an affirmative duty to investigate and take appropriate remedial action, even if the employee making the complaint is resistant to pursue the matter. As I pointed out in the record before you, I was not uh, interjecting, nor did I ever interject myself in my brother's termination hearing. In fact, the testimony of Dwayne Bowman, who the relator cites, specifically stated when asked the question, did Judge Hunter call anybody about saving her brother's job? He said no. Did Hunter do anything? Did she contact any employee of the court that you were aware about saving her brother's job? He said absolutely not. He did say that Hunter was involved in everything that happened at the juvenile court, and I absolutely was. The moment I took office in 2012, after a two-year battle, I should have taken office in 2011, I took two years to win the election lawsuit, but as soon as I took office, I engaged myself in every area of the juvenile court. And I didn't just send emails requesting information in his investigation as the law required me to do under the manual and under the labor enforce enforcement training that I received from this court. I spent two days of judicial orient orientation training under uh, Lynn De Weber, I believe, and I even provided the documentation to the Board of Conduct showing that as the judge, I was the employer of the court. It's set out in the statute, 2151-2152, the Ohio Revised Code. Thank sets you. out, thank you. Mr. Sheets. Good morning, Chief Justice. May it please the court. My name is Don Sheets and I'm here on behalf of Relator, the Office of Disciplinary Counsel. Today we are asking you to adopt the board's recommended findings of fact 
its conclusions of law, and impose its recommended sanction and indefinitely suspend respondent from the practice of law with credit for time served under her interim felony suspension. What does that actually mean? If we the indefinite suspension with credit for time served. That means based on the amount of time. So uh, under Section 25 of Gubbar Rule 5, that governs reinstatement after uh, an indefinite suspension has been imposed. Once two years has passed, either um, with credit for an, uh, an interim felony suspension or otherwise, she can apply for reinstatement at that point. So has she done so? She has. She has. So she would be able to immediately submit, submit a petition for reinstatement. I'd like to address uh, several of respondents' points that she made during her argument. Initially, she cited due process. Due process has been met in this case. This court has defined the contours of due process and it did so in the Tamburino case, which is cited in our brief. Due process is met when a respondent receives a hearing, when a respondent is allowed to issue subpoenas and depose witnesses, and when they are provided with an opportunity to develop an and provide an explanation for the circumstances surrounding their conduct. She received due process in this matter. It was not denied. She argued that the board rejected her exhibits. That's simply not accurate. She did submit exhibits, but later offered objections to those exhibits. This is all part of the record. Some of those exhibits were rejected because they were offered for an improper purpose. Here, her conviction, the judgment entry of conviction, which has been affirmed by the First District Court of Appeals, uh, has been um, commented on by the Federal District Court, which stated there was strong evidence supporting her conviction. So were some of her exhibits admitted? Um, well, some were excluded because they were being offered to collaterally attack her conviction, which she is not allowed to do in a disciplinary proceeding. Others, uh, rulings were reserved until she identified the purpose for those exhibits. The panel chair expressly stated if these exhibits are offered for mitigation or if they're offered to contradict an element of a code of judicial conduct violation that isn't necessarily supported by the conviction itself, they may be offered for those purposes and the panel chair reserved ruling at that time. What happened was respondent didn't offer those exhibits at hearing. And you'll have the full transcript, you will see she offered no exhibits at hearing. It's not that they were excluded or weren't allowed in, she simply didn't offer them. Additionally, due process requires that she have an opportunity to explain the circumstances surrounding her conduct. She was provided that. She had six weeks to file a closing argument. She didn't do so. As you'll see, when you review the exhibits, which includes the um, factual findings of the 8th District Court of Appeals, she had an unlawful interest in a public contract, her brother's employment contract. She was convicted by a jury. It's been affirmed by every court that's well, reviewed say, it. And, and that's true, and, and, and obviously we have no say over the conviction, but she said she had a public interest in her brother's employment. And okay, assuming a family member has an interest in another family member's employment, what exactly did that mean? Well, the way it occurred in this case is he was, he worked for the juvenile detention facility. He was involved in a physical altercation with the youth while there, and he was facing termination proceedings. They were looking, they were determining whether or not he would be fired. And did she intervene in those proceedings? She did. In what way? Several. So the day her brother was notified of the fact that he would be facing possible determination, that night she sent an email um, to the court explaining that she was going to examine patterns and practices in the juvenile detention facility and she listed out a number of factors and issues she was going to look at. Those issues virtually mirrored the defenses that her brother gave um, to defend his actions when he was in that physical education with the youth. Okay, what did she do with that information? Then, uh, well she set the meeting. Uh, mirroring his reasons, the reasons he provided. Then on the 29th, several days later, this is July, she sent an email to the superintendent, Dwayne Bowman, asking for all records relating to this youth, broad documentation for every incident, everything related to this youth. This was, as he testified, highly unusual for a judge to intercede in this type of way. And it was more information than would have been shared with anyone not directly on the investigative team. What so did she do with that information? Then she provided documentation to her brother following her receipt. He, he complied. He gave her a chance to, to clarify because he thought maybe he was misreading her request. But no, she reiterated that she wanted every, every bit of documentation that was related to this youth. 
that same within a day or two, she provided documentation to her brother, and then her brother took that documentation and provided it to his attorney, the attorney who was defending him in his termination proceedings. Um, Had she done any of this for an employee under the same circumstances who was not related to her? No, what, there's no evidence she did this for, for anyone. No, no, I said, had she done the exact same thing for another employee at the court who was not related to her, would that have been a crime? Mm -hmm. The statute she was charged under deals with either a personal interest or a familial interest. Um, so if, if it was, it would not have been under that particular code section. There would have been a factual distinction. And so, so the, the, the violation of, of Section A1 was, in her position as a judge, obtaining information about the policies and procedures that mirrored his reasons for um, termination proceedings, and then acquiring information that only she or n maybe another employee of the court could have obtained in her capacity in providing them to her brother as a defense for his upcoming termination hearing. That's correct. And there was testimony that the type of documentation that she obtained for herself, that she used her judicial position to obtain, would not have been provided to an employee under any circumstances. So would not have been, would not have been given to anyone other than a judge? Or um, it was unusual to even have it provided to the judge, but yes, it would never have been uh, provided to any employee under any circumstances. With this, Did the was employee the have to, to turn over those records? So typically the way these cases, this is another unusual uh, set of circumstances in this case. Typically what happens is the employee appears for the first hearing of the termination proceeding. Before the first hearing, discovery is not typically provided. The routine way these proceed is that the uh, employee appears, employee appears with counsel, discovery has not been provided, they request discovery at that time, and it's continued to give them an opportunity to prepare. What was different in this case than every other case was the attorney was prepared and ready to proceed and did so on the first day. Uh, so that is another highly unusual circumstance showing the preparation and the opportunity that was afforded to her brother that was not afforded to other employees. And my final question, uh, and this because I know it's just dealing with the conviction, how is everything that was said here that you did done to secure authorization of a contract? A uh, continuation of the contract, essentially. It doesn't say continuation, it says secure authorization. I, I understand, Your Honor, and uh, as part of the due process she's received, she's had an opportunity to make the, these arguments at the trial level, she had an opportunity to make these arguments in the, before the first district. This has already been argued and litigated and overruled. So and assuming, assuming that I or anybody on this panel assumes, uh, finds that that was a wrongful conviction that would have no con no bearing on the proceedings today. I would submit to the court, it was brought up and a memorandum of jurisdiction was presented to this court after the first district affirmed her conviction and jurisdiction was not taken. Um, so, so at that time, perhaps it could have been reviewed by this court. But for the purposes of this proceeding, there are no collateral attacks. The conviction stands. Um, she has had reams of due process reviewed by numerous courts. Every court that has reviewed this has affirmed this conviction. The federal court stated there was strong evidence supporting the jury's conviction. Um, so for the purposes of this proceeding, there are no collateral attacks and it's considered final. Thank you. Thank you. Counsel, the information she requested as judge, she had a right to request that information though, correct? Yes. It may be unusual, but she had a right to request it. it. It was unusual for that court, and yes, she she could have. Had she not have disseminated it to her brother, we wouldn't be here today. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. And to, to follow up on that point, <coughs> judicial duties often come into come into conflict with the code of judicial conduct. Sometimes judges can't hear cases because it's a family member or it's a personal, it's, it's a judge's duty to hear cases and issue rulings. But when that comes up against a code of judicial conduct or a law, then the judge's duty gives way, right? We bring in another, we bring in another judge, we ask for a visiting judge, we ask someone else to handle it. So routinely judicial duties give way before the criminal law and the code of judicial conduct. So, and let me go back too, to, to Judge Lewis's question. She had a right to secure the, the documents, although maybe, maybe unusual. You don't dispel the fact or you don't disagree she had the right to give them to someone. And in this case, you're saying just not a family member. So if she'd given them to her brother and they were never used, would that still be a violation? 
Well, I'll say for the purpose of this, uh, if it was a crime or would have been a crime to disseminate to someone who isn't a family member, I want to clarify my position. It may be a violation of, a, of another criminal statute, uh, but it, they would not have proceeded under this particular statute. And and the I, assuming that the decision was made that her mens rea or her reason for doing so, her thinking, was to secure authorization according to the statute, secure authorization of a public contract as opposed to give information that he might use to defend himself from termination and or um, bring out instances of maybe whether, where, where he's being treated dissimilarly to other employees or um, had there been some other situation involving the, the child in this case? Well, there, 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 is, there is statutory language and we're right to look at, but at the heart of this case, she's protecting her brother's job. That's what this case is about. She's not allowed to do it, and it's a crime for her to have done so. But A1 doesn't say she's not allowed to do that. I'm sorry? Where does A1 say she's not allowed? Well, that's, a, that's what it boils down to in this case. She can't, her, her brother had a, a public employment contract. She, he's paid publicly. He had an employment contract. When he was about to lose it, she used her office. But did, was it to protect it or to help him defend it? Couldn't she have picked up the phone and called the, the supervisor and say, don't fire my brother? Yes, she could have. And, and, but that wouldn't have been a violation. Would that have been a violation of yes. A1? Okay. Yes. Just because there are other ways she could have committed the crime, it doesn't mean she didn't commit it this way, I'll, I'll, I'll submit. Okay. She could have been more overt about it. She could have been less subtle about it, um, but she wasn't. But at any rate, we're not really uh, entitled to, empowered to deny the conviction because that's been no, through. No, that's right. Yes. So, so, so then I get to the disciplinary. So in light of that, um, an indefinite suspension, Yes, Your Honor. She's been unable to practice law for how many years now? Approximately nine. Approximately nine years. So disciplinary counsel's position is indefinite suspension, credit for time served. She's eligible to apply to get her license back today. There'd be no reason why disciplinary well, counsel the would court object. makes a decision and entry. Well, so once you've issued your decision, she'll be able to, right. yes. Right. right. Once this case is yeah, well, resolved, so I take it back. Not today. On how it not today, right? right not today. Thanks. But after the case is resolved, she's able to apply disciplinary counsel, whatever. So you have no objections to that. To her, no, no, no. We support that outcome. We're asking that she be indefinitely suspended with credit for time served. As soon as this court issues its decision, if you adopt our recommended sanction, which is also the board's recommended sanction, she'll be able to apply for reinstatement at that time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I want to address sanction in the Schmidt case. Um, Your, Your Honor, you're absolutely correct. That case was not cited because it's distinguishable. She wasn't an attorney. She's a judge. Judges are held to the highest um, standards of ethical conduct. And this court has previously compared attorneys and judges and has said that judges are held to higher standards of integrity and higher standards of ethical conduct. Uh, and there aren't a lot of judges committing felonies. And there aren't a lot of cases. Uh, it's a serious matter. And it doesn't happen. And that's why we're asking that you take this so seriously seriously to instill confidence in the judiciary. There's no precedent involving a judge that has facts like this, though, that you're aware of? No. Okay. So, I mean, I, <clears throat> the argument that I do believe judges should be held to a, to a higher standard, okay? And it's a serious thing and a threat to public confidence when a judge is convicted of any type of felony. Okay? That, that goes without saying. But... Um, just saying that a, the argument that a judge has never been given a lesser sanction than indefinite sus suspension um, shouldn't prevent a judge from arguing that their cases are different or have mitigating factors that may warrant something lesser. Otherwise, why have, the, why have us d decide these things? Why not just have a rule that says that? Well, that is an option. The court could craft a bright line rule that says any time um, a judge commits a felony. But that uh, would fly in the face of disciplinary action is supposed to be designed to protect the public, not really so much punish the offender. 
Well, so that's a complicated question. So sometimes in order to protect the public, punishment is necessary. It's not our purpose. I'm not, I'm not asking you to punish anyone here today. But sometimes it's a tool to use in order to protect the public. And when the situation calls for it to protect the public, then that's a tool we should use. Um, not our purpose, but, but a way to achieve our purpose. Thank you. Regarding creating a bright line rule or not, it's within your discretion to do it. Um, a strength of our disciplinary system is its flexibility, but sometimes matters are so serious to ensure and instill public confidence, we do create bright line rules. Misappropriation, the starting point is disbarment. Um, when you don't cooperate, when you neglect your client's cases and then fail to uh, cooperate in the disciplinary invest, uh, investigation, we started an indefinite. So there aren't many but we do apply them um, in matters of serious concern. So that is an option for the court. But however, it's unnecessary to look to a bright line rule to get to this sanction. I see I'm out of, out of time. If you'd like me to continue, I have. Counsel, I just have one question. Are, are you aware of any judge in the state of Ohio or any incidents when the judge was convicted of a felony when they didn't either receive an indefinite suspension or they were disbarred? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hunter, you are beyond the time, but I will give you one minute for a final statement in response. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to address a couple of issues um, and discrepancies that were pointed out by Relator. Number one, exculpatory evidence was withheld in my case that my brother Stephen Hunter had submitted to the juvenile court, including the judges, including Superintendent Dwayne Bowman, including the Jobs and Family Services, including the uh, Employment uh, um, Civil Rights Division, that he had no intention of returning to the juvenile court. Scott Croswell was aware that my brother had made very clear that he did not plan to return to the juvenile court, so it was legally and factually impossible for me to save a job that he had already rejected. Number two, his attorney, Janaev Trotter, now judge, was also my attorney. She was representing me in cases because the prosecutor's office was conflicted. She was specifically asked the question on the stand, did Judge Hunter commit any ethical violations? She said no. If, she if said did could, Hunter you, commit any criminal? I'm you, sorry. If you could go back, would you do yes. the same thing you did? I did the same thing, and I believe that this is what Justice was asking a little while ago. She said, was there any evidence that I did this in every case? And the problem is that absolutely there were. There are thousands of emails with Judge Hunter's name on them, and probably 20 that say the exact same thing and, exact th and ask for or request the exact same information in my brother's case. I did the exact same thing, sent the exact same standard email in every single case. Did you ever tested. give documents to someone else that was not rela related to you? I did not you? give documents. Documents. That's the problem. There's, I didn't give documents, and my brother was the intake officer of juvenile court. He created the documents for Superintendent Dwayne Bowman that he gave to me. So it was not necessary for me to provide any documentation, and thank you for bringing that up, because the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution says that a person has the right to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation. I'm not sure if you, rec if you know that we're talking about documents that have never been identified. I believe my Sixth Amendment right has been violated because I absolutely to this day have no idea what documents we're talking about because the realtor has not identified them. Scott Croswell did not identify them. No one identified them. And you know why they didn't identify them? Because there were no confidential non-public documents that were provided to my brother. Because had there been, they would have disclosed them. I have no idea, and I have the right, even as the respondent and as a defendant in the case, to have been notified of the nature and the cause of the accusation against me. And to this date, I have no idea the identity of the documents that are in question, and neither does relator. Counsel, you were convicted at the trial court level, correct, by a jury? Pardon me? You were convicted at the trial court level by a jury. Three jurors came forward the same day of you're, trial you're and immediately stated that they had um, that they did not find me guilty, and Justice Norbert Nadel, now deceased, refused to poll the jury. It was national news, and all of the experts across the country said that it was problematic that the jury was not polled, and I believe he didn't poll the jury because he knew that those three jurors had come forward to say that guilty was not their verdict. You've exercised every 
possible appeal on the underlying conviction. Is that correct? Well, the first district court that, of appeals was yes, comprised sir. of the friends of the prosecutor who made the allegations. Yes, it is. But if you look at the records that I also provided, look at all of the cases. Supreme Court precedent in this court says that no judge in the same court should rule on a case involving a, a, a colleague. And yet in Hamilton County, Ohio, I was subject to the colleagues of all of the judges in Hamilton County, which was specifically prescribed, proscribed by this court in multiple Supreme Court precedent cases that they failed to follow in my case. For purposes of mitigation, have you ever taken responsibility for any of those actions? That you I did convicted? not commit a crime, and so, and, and I, in fact, all the cases that they used, federal crimes of people that committed all these heinous crimes, they said in every single instance, well, her conduct, respondent's conduct didn't rise to the level, but because she refuses to accept responsibility. I did my job as a Hamilton County Juvenile Court. I followed the statute. I followed the Ohio Revised Code. I followed the employment manual of the, of the, personnel, uh, the personnel manual of the Juvenile Court, and most importantly, I followed the employment training that was provided to me by the Ohio Supreme Court that instructed me as judge that I was the employer of the court and I had a responsibility to investigate every single instance of, of allegations brought against any employee of the juvenile court because whether it was my brother or anyone else, if a charge or if a, if an, uh, a lawsuit had brought, been brought against the court, it would have been brought against Judge Tracy Hunter. So I had a duty, an ethical duty and a legal duty under the law to know everything that was going on in my court. And if you check the thousands of emails at the juvenile court, you will find that I absolutely knew everything that was going on. It was not unusual. But what about the appearance of impropriety? The problem Given the fact that the person you were concerned of was your brother involving I, yourself, wouldn't it have been better to, do so, to bring it to someone else? I to didn't the, to do. To do the investigation yourself? I didn't do the, no. My, I didn't do the investigation because of my brother. Other employees of the juvenile court came to me and were complaining. In fact, it was on the news about a month ago. I felt vindicated because employees of the juvenile court were being constantly injured during restraints in the juvenile court. A number of them came to me as a juvenile court judge and said, Judge, we are being forced to, um, to quit it, uh, when our work compensation runs out because we're being injured by the juveniles. We need you to do something. We need you to have a meeting. My brother was gone from the court. The employees of the youth center came to me and asked me to meet with them. There are tons of emails, and, and I requested discovery on all my emails. They refused to provide my emails, even for my trial. And when Relator notified me they wanted to bring a complaint against me, I said, well, will you please help me to get my emails from juvenile court, because it will prove to you everything that I've been saying for years. I did the same thing in every single instance, and I only talked to the employees of the juvenile court because they came to me all of them, and it was on the news. Check the newscast from a few weeks ago. The same things that they were coming to me for help about 10 years ago, or nine years ago before I was suspended, is the same thing that just bubbled over because all of them are being injured and nobody intervened, but I intervened and met with them. I changed the youth policy dress code because they told me that it would make them safer when visitors were coming. Ms. Hunter, and I know your time is up, so the chief is probably Thank gonna you. cut you up, but just let me ask you a final question. Yes, what would you have this court do? What would you have us find? I really ask, I mean, to be honest, you can't make me whole after 10 years. So what would you have us do? What would I you would have, have us decide? I would have you dismiss this complaint against me because there is still a post-motion conviction pending in, in, in Hamilton County. I would ask you to dismiss the complaint against me and make me whole as possible by reinstating my law license. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the matter under advisement and you'll receive a decision from the court.